when a visitor comes to Bishop Street, perhaps to go to the cafe, perhaps to worship. What is unmistakable is this great organ case. Standing against the east wall, above the choir stalls, above the organist. But it wasn't always like that. When the place opened in 1816, there would have been no organ. There was probably a small ensemble, an orchestra. And that was the case with very many churches, both nonconformist churches and the established church. The organ comes later, as in fact it did in the case of Bishop Street. You've got to imagine a big blank wall against which there was a single pulpit. It would have been austere and rather plain and would have spoken very eloquently of the ministry of the word. But then, 1847, there was a move. An extra bay was added, an extra section of the church going south. And in that bay, there was room for a choir and probably for the orchestra as well. But 11 years after that, the big change took place. Bishop Street acquired from the big London firm of Grove and Mitchell an organ. The organ itself um, had a, an interesting history. Um, we do know that the case had been in St Margaret's Church in Leicester. It had gone there in 1772. But everybody said that it was the work of Father Smith, organ builder to Charles II. Now Father Smith was a big name in the history of organ building. If you go to London and go to St Magnus Martyr just by the Thames, there is a magnificent Father Smith organ case. But it's at the west end of the church, i.e. not the pulpit end, and it overlooks where the choir would have stood. In the case of Bishop Street, you look up to it. As someone said, it's almost as if you're worshipping the organ. So that came in 1858. There were then a number of alterations to the instrument, and I think in order to think about those, we'd better go up into the place reserved for the organist and choir. Having climbed up the winding stairs, one is now on the threshold of the organ and choir area. Incidentally, the organist and choir would not have entered this way. There is a door there, which was the door into the choir vestry. The choir would meet together beforehand to sort their music out and then usually have a prayer with the minister and then they would file in. All this of course um, is history and history is being made again because at the moment we are undertaking a very big restoration of the organ. What will happen is that all the pipes, the mighty ones that stand at the front and the tiny ones, these will all be cleaned and they will all be regulated. And the ones at the front, those mighty pipes that make it look so Baroque, so very late 17th, early 18th century, they will be gilded, painted with gold paint. So they will gleam when you come into the church. When this organ was installed, it was placed, the, uh, the console here, as they call it, was placed up against the grand organ case. So it was flanked on either side by these delicious little Baroque cherubs, beautifully carved with their own little circle of wreaths and their own wings. It wasn't until the 1930s that it came down here and it was useful here, of course, because from this position, the organist could conduct the choir. And there are more changes on the way, but uh, we have to wait and see for what happens then. 
the organ console that was put here in the 1930s by Hill um, has a number of interesting features. I've already said that its position helps the organist slightly elevated to look at the choir and conduct them. There's also something which I think is rather delicious. These stops in a great semicircle range from left to right. In a lot of organs, the stops are in panels to the left or right. These are in the style of the cinema organ. And that rather suggests that there was something of popular showmanship about the way the organ was played and the way the organ was featured. recent work on the organ has come across something which is, I think, really rather interesting. By looking at the way the wood was cut in this great 17th, early 18th century organ case, the experts conclude that it probably comes not from the work of Father Smith, but the work of Christopher Schreider, who was in the Father Smith firm who married Smith's daughter and who carried the business on. An extra little uh, soupçon of historical context. What is unmistakable though, and you can see it beautifully sitting here, are those great cherubs. And it fits in with the imagery that Methodists sing about, in particular Meet and write it is to sing in every time and place. A kind of guide to Methodism's commitment to music and singing. And one of the verses in that hymn contains deliciously apposite words. Thee, the firstborn sons of light, in choral symphonies. That's what those cherubs are. They're taking place in a great choral symphony in, to use another Wesleyan phrase, a rapture of praise. Oh,